This is video history from the J. Bay Jacobs Library for the History of Obstetrics and Gynecology in America, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. It's a lovely May day in the early spring of 1993. And my guest today is Dr. Harold A. Kamenetsky, who was president of the college in 1978 and since 1985 has been director of practice activities for ACOG based here in Washington. Harold, uh, thanks for joining me today. Happy to be here, Mark. Let me begin by uh, asking you, uh, as, as we like to do, uh, where you were born and, and a little bit about where you got your education. Uh, I was born in Chicago, Illinois, and uh, had my uh, grammar school education and high school education in Chicago uh, on what was then considered the north side of Chicago. Uh, following graduation from high school, I attended Northwestern University in Evanston uh, for a period of uh, three years and then had an hiatus in the Navy as an enlisted man. Where, for how long a time and where were you? For two years uh, and finally ended in Okinawa right as World War II was ending. Came back and then started medical school. So I had that period of time between. That was at the University of Illinois? The University of Illinois. And uh, continued there uh, for four years. Following that, I had an internship at uh, Cook County Hospital, uh, followed by a residency at the then Research and Educational Hospitals of the University of Illinois. Now it has another name. You're uh mentor as uh, departmental chairman when you were a resident was? Was Frederick Falls, uh, who uh, uh, finished his term as chairman of the department at the time I finished my residency. Did, did Dr. Falls play any role in the founding of the college? Uh, only uh, marginally. He was uh, engaged in the, uh, I, I believe it was called the American Committee on Maternal Welfare, but with another famous Chicago obstetrician named Fred Adair, uh, which I believe was uh, not the predecessor organization, but at least was. an organization that attempted to bring a national scope to our specialty, and specifically uh, the problem of maternal welfare. Now, I certainly remember your career as being uh, Chicago-based, or primarily Chicago-based in uh, those years, uh, and academic-based as well. Uh, when you finished the residency, that was, you said, in 1949? No, the residency was uh, actually finished in 1950. 19 I'm sorry, Mark, 1954. Okay, in 54. What happened then in your career? Uh, I spent uh, about a year in uh, private practice, part-time, and continued on the... Uh, part-time faculty at the University of Illinois for a year. And then in 1955, uh, there was a change in departmental chairman, William F. Mengert, who certainly is a famous name in the history of the college, right? Uh, came and uh, uh, we got together, and uh, he was a strong influence on uh, that period of my life. He was a strong influence on a lot of things. He was. And uh, he... Uh, uh, asked me to join him on the full-time faculty, which I did uh, at the end of 1955. And from that period on, I was a member of the full-time faculty uh, through 1968 and uh, developed my academic career during those periods of time and rose to the position of professor uh, by the time I left. And uh, I remember you uh, as we got together and in mid, things Midwestern, probably starting out in the early 1960s. Uh, what, what were your special academic interests then? I, I remember what you wrote on, but... Uh, uh, my, my interest really was related to two topics. One was experimental cervical cancer. Uh, as you know, that was a period when the pap smear was uh, in rapid development. <laughs> And I became interested in the fact that uh, certain of the smears uh, seem to reflect the possibility of precancer, but rather quickly disappeared. 
whereas other smears, which apparently had similar morphology, eventually seemed to progress to carcinoma in situ and ultimately into invasive cancer. And I was looking for an experimental model with which to see if this could be duplicated and found it by the use of uh, first pedophilum, which was, as uh, you know, a topical applicant uh, used in uh, condyloma acuminata. Uh, people who studied condyloma acuminata following the application of pedophilum found bizarre distortion in the anatomy of the cells. The nuclei became very large, nucleoli became very prominent, the margins of the nuclei became uh, very much distorted, very similar to the appearance of cancer cells, but of course these lesions then disappeared. We found that we could duplicate the effect on the normal human cervix, which we tried in women who had uh, condyloma and then were to undergo hysterectomy for benign uterine disease. Having developed that model, we then found that uh, we could do the same in mice, and ultimately, as the experiments progressed, was it were able to duplicate it in monkeys, and then try to determine uh, how these lesions compared to those that uh, resulted from the application of methylcholine through carcinogen. I, I also uh, I get remember you. I expect to actually remember you more for work in nutrition. What, uh, well, uh, at the University of uh, Illinois, as you know, was located in the West Side Medical Center, and uh, almost all of the patients seen there were uh, underserved or difficult to serve women of very low income. And it became uh, clear to those of us who are looking at it that a number of women uh, who were, as a matter of fact, not typically described as obese, but were in fact very definitely underweight, developed preeclampsia quite early in the game. And uh, we were searching for an answer. Uh, clearly, if you studied the diet histories of such patients, which we did, uh, you found that their intake of protein was remarkably low. Uh, total caloric intake was remarkably low, sometimes as few as 900 kilocalories. So began then an interesting period of study about nutrition and pregnancy, which I then continued when I moved to New Jersey Medical School. Okay. Now, in, in 1968, uh, if I recall correctly, you went on to New Jersey and a fairly rapid rise in academic ranks. Uh, tell me about that. Well, I went there as a uh, professor and chairman and uh, began my work uh, scientifically in both nutrition and in experimental carcinogenesis. Uh, after about two and a half years, uh, there was a change in the location of the, uh, of the medical school from Jersey City to Newark. And following that, the change in the presence of the uh, then developing College of Medicine and Dentistry of New Jersey, subsequently renamed the University of Medicine and Dentistry of New Jersey. Uh, with the change in uh, the uh, uh, resignation of the dean, the president asked if I would be acting dean, and uh, I agreed to do it. Just what one always needed on top of being a departmental yeah. chairman. Yeah. And, uh, served uh, for about six or eight months. A search committee was established and uh, was urged to uh, agree to stand as a candidate, which I agreed to do with the proviso that I had the right to return as chairman uh, after a designated period, two and a half more years. So I served as dean and as department chairman for a total of about uh, two and three quarter years. Following that time, I decided that I much preferred the role of chairman and stepped down. Now, of course, you're, you're with us today uh, for a number of reasons. One of them was that you began uh, in the early 70s a very active career with ACOG. 
first by being elected as uh, secretary. Can you trace that for, for us? Uh, yes, that was uh, my, it really had to do with my academic life in, uh, at the uh, University of Illinois. Uh, the college office, uh, certainly at that time, was very much smaller, and uh, there were very, very few full-time people there. Uh, and it was felt by uh, the executive board that it would be high utility for someone who lived and worked in Chicago to participate actively in the work mm -hmm. of the administrative office. I didn't realize that. This yes. was a, a, your basic cost-saving measure. Yes, yes. I was... Uh, relatively inexpensive uh, without salary. And uh, they also felt that any time, anyone in full-time academic medicine certainly didn't have, have plenty of time, time certainly. So surely uh, on the basis of cost and availability of time. So that really began uh, a career in ACOG uh, as secretary. And that continued, I believe, for six or eight years. I can't remember the number. And you were then ultimately elected president in 1978. In 1978. Right. I've been vice president and uh, a number of side issues of that sort. Well, as a matter of fact, I well remember your presidential welcome because the college annual clinical meeting was in New York and you went to the podium and said you'd like to welcome everyone to Greater Newark. <laughs> the uh, uh, after you were president of the college, uh, tell us a little bit about the things that transpired between then and the time that you came to join the full-time staff in 1985. Uh, I, can, I continued uh, with my work as department chairman. The New Jersey Medical School was a relatively new one, and of course uh, many changes were occurring. A new medical institution was built in Newark, the locus of the institution having changed from Jersey City to Newark. So there was much to do with the construction of a totally new campus in the inner city uh, and uh, having a value of approximately a billion dollars with a large basic science teaching facility and a brand new university hospital. Uh, the development then of new programs, uh, new educational methods, and uh, that occupied me. In the meantime, along with that work came uh, more work for the college, of course, on a volunteer basis. The uh, FIGO Congress occurred in, uh, I believe it was 1981. So spent a number of years uh, as a volunteer again. Uh, working with the very able people in the college office, trying to develop the framework for what was the uh, 81 uh, World Congress had to be held in San Francisco. So that occupied part-time, probably four or five years of time. Then in, in 1985, uh, you were among a series of applicants for the director of practice activities of the college when Irvin Nichols retired and uh, you know, with background such as you had, you certainly were a strong and obvious candidate and I remember came to join us in the early spring of 1985. Now, eight years have passed by uh, since then, Harold. What, you know, tell us something about uh, what you believe you've accomplished as director of practice, which is, is uh, of course, a great deal, and what, which things you might focus on as having been the major contributions to the college and to health care of women in general. Uh, you know, as I see it, uh, among, uh, you know, having not been uh, alone in the accomplishment, <coughs> as you well know, Warren, uh, we have a superb uh, staff at the college, and I inherited from uh, Urban Nichols some um, extraordinarily capable people who are not physicians but have uh, great imaginativeness, capable of uh, learning, capable of organization. For, for the, the people who uh, look at this tape uh, 20 years from now, uh, who were those people? Uh, those people were Shirley Shelton, Elaine Locke, and then uh, ultimately Kathy Bryant in government relations. Uh, and uh, they were three major forces in the development that followed. Uh, our government relations activity to start there uh, simply for no special reason uh, 
was uh, really the fulfillment of one of my goals in being president of the college, namely to bring the college uh, with the, the help of the task force that you had appointed to Washington and then to begin to interact with government in the best interests of women's health, recognize that it was our job to uh, portray our deep interest in women's health to the Congress and to the regulatory bodies, uh, a, a process that we really couldn't carry out quite as well when we were located in Chicago. And that process, I believe, has worked very well, culminating, as I think people know, in 1993 in a government relations group that uh, is uh, fully capable of reacting and interacting with all levels of government. And I think in uh, not only in the best interests of obstetrician gynecologists, but even more importantly, in the best interests of women who all haven't always had so strong an advocate regarding health. Certainly in, in the uh, remaining few minutes that we have, uh, the publications and uh, that have come out of practice uh, the guidelines, the standards, uh, other statements have certainly been key activities in the college. Could you say a word about those? Well, I, I'd like to say uh, something about those and the, and the people most closely involved. Shirley Shelton is the, per, the associate director in charge of clinical practice, and uh, she's been, uh, has a major responsibility of staffing the committees on uh, obstetrics, fetal maternal medicine, and gynecologic practice. Those committees consider the broadest range of issues that uh, involve clinical practice per se and the scientific issues undergirding those, uh, those practice activities. Uh, each new item that occurs in the discipline that relate to those subjects are considered by the committees and statements are developed as appropriate to try to bring our fellows the newest and best in information. Furthermore, we've begun to consider the issue of practice standards, quote, practice guidelines, so that uh, we, can, uh, we can participate in what appears to be a national, <coughs> national plan for uh, developing a, a broad range of guidelines by which our fellows can uh, treat their patients. It's no longer appropriate or desirable that individuals plan their own activities unrelated to standards or guidelines that are informed by the best of available material in the medical literature. Uh, if I can pass yes. on to uh, the other part of practice, Warren, uh, we have uh, another uh, division in practice uh, headed by Elaine Locke, another very gifted person, uh, that involves all kinds of liaison activities. Uh, practice must, of course, interact with uh, other medical disciplines in a variety of ways, and then in addition must interact with uh, certain public groups that are concerned with women's health. And uh, this is uh, an important episodic kind of activity that involves the broadest possible content. My guest today, Harold A. Kamenetsky, uh, a fellow who began college activities with one of the real founders of the college, uh, Dr. William Mengert, uh, who served as a volunteer secretary and uh, general overseer of the office, who served as president and has been a vital part of the college uh, in these last eight years as the full-time director of practice activities. Godspeed for the future. Thank you.